All right, everybody. It is 5 p.m. on Monday, October 28th, 2024. This is a regular board meeting for the Monroe School District. President or myself, Vice President Campbell, uh, Director Barnes, Director Etzcorn, Director Whitfield, Student Representative Sophia Willett, and Myron Robinson, District Leadership, School District staff, as well as members of the community. And President Bumpus and Superintendent Woodward will not be in attendance this evening. Uh, members of the public can log in on to the regular board meeting using the Zoom link attached to tonight's agenda that is found on the board docs website. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, welcome to tonight's uh, board meeting. We're happy to have you join us. All comments during tonight's meeting are audio recorded and will be available online on our website. This is in addition to the written minutes. Please understand that while it may appear that the board is moving quickly on important matters, there have been previous discussions on these issues, either in earlier meetings or in board workshops, which are also open public meetings. Each director has had ample time to study the issues and uh, ask appropriate questions and obtain satisfactory answers from the superintendent, his staff, or through outside research. Those wishing to address the board during the public comments must turn in a public comment form prior to the start of the meeting at 5 o'clock p.m. Any form submitted after the meeting has started will be held for the next meeting to address the board at that time. All right, moving on to agenda item 2.04. We have no changes to the agenda. And so that opens us up to 2.05 to approve the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the agenda dated October 28th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. All right, there's a motion and a second to approve the agenda item dated October 28th, 2024. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes 420. All right, moving on to agenda item 3.01, Frank Wagner Elementary School Counseling Program. And we have Ms. Brooke Fox for our presentation tonight. Appreciate it. All right, I think this is great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. So I'm gonna address um, MTSS, the multi-tiered systems of support and how it relates to school counseling. So I'm going to touch on a tier two intervention that I did for kiddos last year um, with some fourth grade students, as well as some tier one violence prevention that we've been doing this year. So the tier two intervention summary, um, tier two just means a targeted or, so tier one is what every kiddo receives, tier two is a targeted intervention for some kiddos, tier three is an intensive, uh, more intensive intervention. So this tier two was with fourth grade girls, it was seven, seven students, nine week small group and delivered by me in my office. Um, I use data to identify which kiddos need more support. And I really wanna highlight that because um, one, the American School Counseling Association, their national model requires that we do so. Um, and it also lets us um, show that what we're doing is effective and has an impact. I know a lot of counselors shy away from data and that is I think people may, may take it personally. However, it's critical that we do incorporate it so that we know we're actually being effective with kiddos. So the targeted group was chosen because they were all critical at risk for attendance, um, self-reported medium strengths for self-efficacy. And so I aligned that and how we um, target kiddos for uh, academic interventions or a lot of kiddos for our, like our lap interventions. We target the bubble students, those kiddos who need a little bit extra to get to grade level. Um, so medium strengths for self-efficacy, and we administer the BZ, so brief externalizing and internalizing screener for youth at Frank Wagner. So all the uh, students were identified as having both internalizing and externalizing behaviors. So why I chose uh, to target self-efficacy was that general self-efficacy beliefs have been shown to positively predict academic achievement and school engagement. Conversely, poor general self-efficacy beliefs have been associated with school absenteeism and school burnout. 
And given that self-efficacy isn't um, necessarily a term that we use in our everyday conversation, OSPI defines it as the skills and mindsets needed to remain engaged, complete challenging work, take appropriate risks, value perspectives and opinions of others, including people representing diverse abilities and cultural and linguistic backgrounds, make healthy choices even when no one was looking. All right, so standards. So just like teachers have, um, counselors also have standards that they need to meet. So the ASCA, American School Counseling Association, the mindsets and behaviors I targeted with this group were the ability to identify and overcome barriers, self-motivation, self-direction, and self-confidence. So there is a crosswalk that does exist if you are interested. Um, it essentially crosswalks the ASCA mindsets and behaviors with OSPI's benchmarks and indicators for social emotional learning. So these are the benchmarks and indicators that aligned with those ASCA um, mindsets. So demonstrates the skill set to monitor, adapt, persevere, achieve, and evaluate goals, and the awareness and ability to speak on behalf of personal rights and advocacy. So um, I won't go through all of these in detail. Essentially, what the group really, group really focused on was growth mindset, um, reframing thoughts, and conflict resolution. All right, so what the data shows, which was really encouraging, um, after the intervention, students believed that they could learn new things even when things are hard. So there was an increase in that. The knowledge piece, so what do students know now that they didn't know before? Um, I can think of helpful solutions when I have a problem that also increased. And then the skill set. So in ASCA, you target um, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So the skills are what, what students can do that they couldn't do before the intervention. So I keep working toward my goals even if I make a mistake, and that also increased. What was really exciting was based on our panorama data, there was a 43% increase for these seven kiddos between semester one and semester two. The small group was given at the very beginning of semester two. Um, so that's a 43% increase. What was even more exciting, there was a 43% decrease in absences. So Unlike teachers, counselors do not have a guaranteed viable curriculum. So it's really important that we um, assess whether or not what we're doing is effective because a lot of the time the curriculum that we are administering is something that we've created ourselves. So that's why I'm very passionate about including data so that I don't continue to do something that doesn't have an impact for kiddos. All right, so in summary, um, I identified the kiddos using data, I facilitated the groups, they gained the attitudes, knowledge, and skills that OSPI and ASCA said they needed to support attendance, and then I progress monitored to show lasting self-efficacy and attendance improvement. So next steps. Um, I would love to evaluate this, and I'm in the process of doing so. Like, how do we make this part of our core curriculum? How do we make this part of what every kiddo receives at Frank Whitener Elementary? Um, also, so t like tier two can be small groups, but the issue with small groups, one, they're really effective. However, you don't reach a lot of kiddos. So what does this look like in a workshop, right? So what does this look like with 20 kiddos with an hour, right? One or two sessions. All right. And also, what does it look like for lower grade levels for our littles? All right. And so that was the tier two piece, right? A targeted group. Um, and then this year, we've been really fortunate to have another counselor join us. Her name is Gladys, and we don't know that she's in the audience, but she is my co-counselor. And so together, her and I have rolled out two tier ones since December, the first of which is Start With Hello. So this is a violence prevention program that included a week of front loading. So we give explicit teaching into what is loneliness and what is social isolation, and then a week of programming at recess. All right, and I just wanna highlight that our comprehensive school counseling program, our goals are not only aligned with our SIP, but also aligned with district goals, which are increasing sense of belonging and attendance. So beyond its implications for mental health, belonging plays a specific role in education. So research shows that belonging positively affects engagement, behavior, and academic performance. And that's taken straight from Panorama. 
Yep. And then it's a violence prevention program. So social isolation is the most important external indicator leading up to mass shootings, making it especially important that kiddos can not only recognize what it looks like to be socially isolated, but know what to do when they see a student who is. All right, so these are the highlights, right? So we did a week of front loading, which just means lessons in classrooms to teach those skills and that knowledge. And then we did a whole week of recess activities. So over 350s were photos were taken at a photo booth where you could be the H and hello or hola. We highlighted the 15 languages spoken at Frank Wagner. So we wrote those at um, car pickup um, and bus drop off. We also printed those 350 photos and mo made those languages in, in the hallways. Um, we had a door decorating contest um, for which there was a popcorn for the winner, popcorn party, clearly everyone won who participated. Um, but what the feedback I heard from that was that kiddos who were typically excluded um, were able to participate with their peers in a really positive way. Um, and not every kiddo gets to feel successful at school. I wish that wasn't the reality, but it is. And so this is also in part really important to provide these opportunities for students so that they are given an opportunity to feel connected, to feel that positive, get that positive feedback and such from their peers. Um, so this is one of our second grade classes, clearly a pretty big uh, turnout for the Wear Green to show commitment to starting with Hello. Um, and this is a conversation treat. So one of our um, activities was write a conversation. How do you start a conversation um, on a hand cutout? And then we made a tree out of them. The other one was to write a note to your trusted adult. And we chose that one because trusted adult is the same verbiage that we use in signs of suicide. So we are getting our kiddos talking about their trusted adult, um, which is a proven way to mitigate both violence and self-harm. We're getting kids to talk about who is their self-adult and use that terminology starting in kindergarten. All right, and then it says currently, but we just wrapped this up. We did a bullying prevention week. So um, the theme was together we can, same thing. We did a week of front loading. So a week of classroom lessons teaching everyone that bullying for the, the main point in teaching it is that bullying happens over and over, right? So getting our kinders and even our preschoolers, how many times, my friends? Over and over and over, right? And shockingly, usually when you teach bullying prevention lessons, there's a huge uptick in reports of bullying, um, only because kids now know the word, it's now in their vocabulary. We haven't had that. So I'm really hoping that that piece stuck, right? That it is something that is repeated. All right, and then why did we do that? Why did we make such a big deal out of bullying prevention. Well, one out of five kiddos is bullied at some point in their school career. And it has pretty significant implications. So just on, honestly, they're very similar to the implications of being socially isolated. So depression, health issues, school issues, self-injury, self-harm, and social issues. What I tried to impart to the kiddos was that as adults, we have influence in schools but the research shows that 57% of bullying stops when a peer intervenes, inter, um, inter, uh, rather. Um, so it's really important to get kids comfortable with doing that because we know that we as adults don't always have that same influence. And the research also shows that it, it stops within 10 seconds, right? So it's really effective if a bystander intervenes. And so I want kids to feel empowered um, to do that. All right, some of our highlights. So Unity Day, it's national, right? It's a wear orange to show your commitment um, to bullying prevention. Um, so we had Frankie join us, our wildcat, and we took photos and we will do this, something similar. Um, I think we'll probably spell Unity or Together We Can in the hallways with those photos. We also did a day where you dressed your culture loud and proud. Um, and this also, you know, plays into the sense of belonging and recognizing and celebrating differences. Um, and that was amazing. Um, that was it. I know I talk fast. If there are any questions, I welcome them. But last and not least, I really want to thank you. So as the board, you approved a transition plan for the State Bill 5030. And this has allowed counselors to do this work. Before 
our time was spent in a lot of reacting and now we're able to do these tier one and tier two prevention services. So thank, thank you. I'll thank my families for letting their kids participate. And I also want to give a huge shout out to my admin. So um, Hugo and Deb have been pretty incredible at guarding my time from non-counseling duties so that I can really implement some meaningful interventions with kids. Um, and so a huge shout out to them and mostly my students for being willing and <laughs> able and excited to participate. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Do you have any questions? Sure. First off, thank you very much for presenting that. That was very exciting. How did you choose the tier two students again? Was yeah. it attendance or, or academic performance based or? Yeah, so it was based on attendance. So all kiddos were at risk oh. or critical. And um, the data showed that after the intervention, um, we had kiddos on track for graduation, which was really exciting. Um, so I actually used three data points. Um, so uh, not only the attendance, but the self-efficacy piece was drawn from Panorama. So the, there are questions that address self-efficacy and how kids rate themselves. It is a self-rating. Um, so I use that as well. So attendance how kids rated themselves in their self-efficacy, and then the BZ, which is a little subjective. So the teachers fill it out. The teachers are like, hey, this kiddo has externalizing behaviors. Clearly, we are pretty good at recognizing which kiddos have externalizing behaviors, right? But we're not so good at recognizing the internalizers. So the kiddos who have self-doubt, who don't want to participate, that sort of thing. Um, and so we really do rely on the teachers who know them more so than maybe I do, or who at least see them more so than I do, to flag those kiddos as well. Um, and so all of these kiddos were at risk for both internalizing and externalizing as well. And do these same strategies work with students that have low self-efficacy? I have not tried it. So that's what's really exciting about the CSCP work and the State Bill 5030 is that it's now allowing us as counselors to not work in silos, right? So the plan for, for this year moving forward is to work as a collective team um, and roll out an intervention similar to this, right? Crosswalk the OSPI and ASCA standards. Um, and then deliver the same group at every single elementary. Right now I have two data points, right? Because I'm one counselor and I did two groups. So if we roll this out across the elementaries, we'll have 14 groups, right? And so it speaks a little bit to us not being, not having a budget for a guaranteed and viable curriculum. So having more data to show whether or not what we are doing is working. Yeah. And is that happening? Is it being rolled out to counselors at other schools? Um, in the Monroe School District, yes, we are working on that. Yeah, absolutely. So in regards to what other schools are doing across the state, I don't know. I know, right, State Bill 5030 says every district needs a comprehensive school counseling program and a transition plan, and every school is at a different place with that. But this is the work that is facilitated when a comprehensive school program, compre comprehensive school counseling program is implemented to its fullest degree. Yeah. Okay, great. So you're sharing these results with the other counselors in Monroe School District? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So especially, I already, I presented this once already to practice, and it was at the, um, at last Friday at the PD session with all of my other counselors. Um, and then I presented this to my elementary counselor group um, in August to get them all on board. Um, there's a sp specific, specific um, certification called RAMP. It means that you're the best of the best in um, school counseling. And that's what I want to achieve within my career. And so this is the start of that. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I just want to thank you for all that you've done. I had the opportunity to come and visit Frank and I saw you there in your Fox shirt. I thought oh, that was yeah. really, that was really cute. Thank um, you. But just seeing the tree on the wall and seeing the doors decorated and seeing all of the photos yeah. with the kids, you know, mm -hmm. making the H and hello and Ola, um, it's really a total shift, you know, in that school over the last few years. And I'm loving what I'm seeing and the kids seem really happy. The teachers are seeming, you know, really engaged and Deb and Ugo are doing an incredible job. Um, it's just, it's fabulous to see. So I'm really thankful that you're there and I'm Thank really you. appreciative of the work that you're doing for our students. <clears throat> well, so. I appreciate you. It's a great place to be. I'm right where I need to be.
you know, a lot of interesting things at meetings with uh, presentations. Um, one of the things that struck me in terms of uh, difficulties that students have, I never think of uh, depression and mental health for younger kids, you know, so this first kindergarten through fifth grade. Yeah. Uh, I've always thought of them as junior high, high school in that area. Sort of, are there kids that really suffering that, that have difficulties? Yeah, I mean, so I I always, when I show up at Devin um, Ugo's office, I'm like, I hate to be the bearer of yet another not so great news, right? And so a lot of my, my work with them is supporting those kiddos, right? So we have kiddos um, starting in kindergarten who have suicidal ideation, right? Whether or not they know what that means, some of them really do, and some of them don't. We have kiddos who are suffering from possible psychosis that we have to refer, or we do refer to Seattle Children's Hospital. The mental health crisis, and we hear a lot about like the adolescent statistics, the mental health crisis extends all through our elementaries. Um, in particular, with our kiddos and our families um, who have a lower socioeconomic status, right? Things have hit them hard um, during the pandemic and after. And so we are seeing an uptick in these struggles in part because we're seeing an uptick in parent struggles, right? And so kids will model what they see and, and that's in part big, big, or why we're seeing some of what we are. But yeah, these, these are issues that affect all of our kiddos, which is why I'm a really strong advocate for starting to talk about mental health at younger ages, right? How do we identify depression? How do we identify a long lasting sadness, right? And get kiddos talking about um, those types of things so we relieve the stigma. I don't have statistics, but anecdotally, I started up at Park Place and there were two instances between the graduating fifth grade and starting sixth grade where kiddos were seen for attempts at taking their own life, attempted suicide. And so I was like, well, we don't teach that yet. Why are we not teaching our fourth graders? Why are we not teaching our fifth graders what mental health is, what reaching out to your safe adult is, defining who your safe adult is. And so last year I was given the go ahead to trial some curriculum, um, just a supplementary activity to teach kids what was depression and what their trusted adult was because um, at least our healthy youth survey shows that 8% of our students of color have seriously considered suicide by the fall of sixth grade. So that doesn't just happen overnight. So these are things that our young kiddos are thinking about. Yeah. Well, that's very, that's a real concern. Yeah. And thank you for your work. It's yeah. important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Brooke, so much. One of the things I, I think I had a question was looking at the replicability of this and some of the next steps that you have. I would love to see as you yeah. uh, continue to take this data and then share that with your your uh, colleague counselors across the district. What does that look like then saying, okay, now how do we go beyond just like tier two, but we can get back to how do we look at doing mental health uh, beneficial, beneficial things for all students? And that means going into the classrooms. And so some of those yeah. strategies looking at, because like you said, you're only one counselor. And you're in a very big elementary school. Very large. And so, yeah. and so how do we, how do we replicate a lot of the things that you found successful tools to be able to make that training model for, uh, for teachers to take in the classrooms as well. Yeah. And so that's something I'm really excited to look at. So thank you yeah. so much. This is really powerful. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think I, again, I cannot emphasize enough that this was only possible because some of the non-school counseling duties were taken off my plate and that was a building decision. So a huge shout out to Hugo and Deb for allowing me to do the work that counselors are trying to do. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, moving on to section four communications and that is our student representatives, Sophia and Myron. Hi, so close. So first I was gonna say that girls volleyball has a game tonight at Lake Stevens at seven. And then girls soccer also has a game tonight at Marysville Getchell at 7.30. And then leadership trainings will start again at the high school with Kristen Page, which will include both leadership development and strategy-based work to create 
systematic change. I've always really liked the leadership trainings because they would include like not only ISB, but the other clubs and you get so much more out of them than just like your regular like classroom setting, like what I had with like Link Crew or what you might just have in your club that you're in. So I always enjoyed those. And then now that homecoming is over, our ACB will be focusing towards planning a great Veterans Day Assembly. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as you guys might all know, um, football won our homecoming game against Meadowdale, and that was for the 4A Wesco title, I think. Um, homecoming was really great. ASB did a good job with the decorating and making the dance look like we were really in Rapunzel, so that was a good job. Shout out to ASB. Um, there were around 60-ish homecoming court nominees. The top two homecoming winners were Maddie Dickinson from Cheer and Ivor Griffith from SportsMed. Um, and football has a type. Is it a title game? I think. So. Oh, district. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, they have a game this Friday um, at home against the Harbor at seven. Okay, a couple questions. First, when is the leadership training with Christian Page? I'm not sure when they are. I think. I don't know. When, I know they start soon. Okay. But they're usually, I know they're usually like in the middle of like the school days. So okay. they start pretty early and they like last around like four hours, if I remember correctly. Okay. okay. And second question is how was homecoming? I loved it. I always loved homecoming. It was kind of sad knowing it was my last homecoming, but ASB did really good this year. Homecoming gets like a little better each year. I think like ASB just finds a way about like planning it better. So it was really good, and I love Rapunzel, so that was my favorite part. Um, I agree with Sophie. Um, it definitely has gotten better over the last two years, and like Sophie said, ASV is just finding a way to make it better each year, and I appreciate them for that because the experience, it just gets better each year, and you can tell they're really putting a lot of effort into it. Well, as a dad of a high school, I got to, I was on the outside for drop off and pick up. And uh, it was really cool. I think for me, one, at the homecoming game, I think it was just really cool. I love how Monroe um, has such a broad nominating process for homecoming that we, we get beyond, I think, what, the traditional is you have like you know one couple from every grade level and that's it but we look at how student engagement of students that are engaged in a wide variety of that and so for me i think that's something that's really cool because we are we're not a small high school and for us to be able to do that and so that was something that's just really encouraging and then uh the other one was just seeing just a vast array of kids um really enjoying themselves at homecoming and feeling seen and feeling connected to um i don't know if you guys know this but i found this out last year they have like a video game section at the homecoming dance. Yeah, that was the face I made right there, right there. That's like, that's, I think that's kind of cool because one, it connects to this generation, things like that. Like you guys do a whole lot more than just dance at the, the thing. You have a photo booth. What are some of the other activities you guys have at the dance? It's on, I know, yeah, there's usually like video games or like there's been board games in the past. I know one year they did like escape rooms. So they're always doing like more than the dance because I know for like some people the dance can be a little much, but they also want to be there still. So they're, they always like put on other stuff so everybody can enjoy it. So for me, like your guys' faces, exactly. That was what I made, but what, the face I made when my son first told me about that, I'm like, they had what at the dance? And, and I think that especially for our generation, like that's just very different. But what I love about that is the heartbeat behind it is, is again, it's the same mentality of how can we do something that makes all of our students feel like they can come together and have a really fun experience and feel like uh, it's not just one thing for one student's type of you know, uh, their preference of what they want, but how do you make all students feel like, hey, this is my community, my school. And that's just something I really appreciate that, that you know, we're trying to do that at the board level. The teachers are trying to do that in the classroom level. And the students like ASB is trying to do that at the student level as well for that community. And so that's something that was really encouraging for me. So 
thank you guys for sharing about that. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, guys. All right, moving on to agenda item 4.02, public comment. Um, we have one public comment for tonight. Public comment forms uh, received after the meeting has started will be saved for the following meeting. We welcome and value public comment on educational issues and recognize the importance of the opportunity for members of the public to express their thoughts to the school board. This is the policy of the Monroe School District to promote mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. We kindly ask that you refrain from comments that violate school district policy. Individuals are asked to limit their comment to three minutes. A designated speaker for a group is asked to keep their comments to five minutes. If you have a person, personnel concern, any staff member in the room can help you with how to go forward with a complaint about personnel. The board does not respond to public comments during the, the business meeting. Please note the board's silence is neutral. It is neither a signal for of agreement nor disagreement with the speaker's remarks. The president may interrupt or terminate the individual statement when it is personally directed, abusive, obscene, irrelevant, targets a protected class, or exceeds the time limit. As the board vice president, I will determine the appropriateness of all such rulings. When I call your name, please step up to the microphone. And our first speaker, I think our only speaker tonight is Katie Woods. Please come on up. Hi, Katie. Please state your name and your relationship to the Monroe School District. Hi, I'm Katie Woods, and I am a community member and also the president of the Monroe Public Schools Foundation. And I'm speaking on behalf of the board of the Monroe Public Schools Foundation, and they are all in the room um, except for one. Um, the Monroe Public Schools Foundation board has decided that we are beginning the process to dissolve the foundation. For years, the foundation has operated as an independent nonprofit foundation to support the Monroe School District. We have proudly facilitated thousands of dollars in scholarships for graduating seniors and provided essential resources, including school supplies, headphones, eyeglasses, food, coats, shoes, beds, alarm clocks, bedding, backpacks, bicycles, clothing, personal hygiene items, and haircuts to students in need. Additionally, we have provided teacher grants and made significant purchases for our schools, such as the lighting at the Monroe um, High School Theater, emergency supply containers in all the classrooms, and STEM kits that were provided district-wide. I want to thank our dedicated board members, volunteer board members, some who, who have served for as long as 12 years. They have tirelessly supported the children of Monroe while balancing full-time jobs. They live in the district, have children who have graduated from Monroe schools, even taught in the district. Many of these volunteers are also active members of multiple community boards and organizations, further demonstrating their commitment to enhancing the lives of students and families in our community. Recent leadership changes within the Monroe School District have influenced the foundation's operations. Over the past year and a half, we have sought to establish a new partnership with the district. Unfortunately, despite our best efforts, we have been unable to reach an agreement that serves all parties involved. Thankfully, those through those discussions, the district has agreed to maintain the community connections coordinator position and keep the student support advocates, which will continue to support the students and staff in the district. As we begin the dissolution process, we are actively seeking collaboration with nonprofits to ensure continued support for our schools and students. We are committed to finding ways students to or finding ways for students to receive the necessary resources to thrive. We would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the Monroe community, educators, and families for allowing us to serve the students of the Monroe Public Schools. Your support has been invaluable, and we hope to continue the spirit of service through partnerships with area organizations. If you have any questions, you can contact the foundation through our website. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Moving on to our business section, agenda item 5.01, consideration to allow sixth grade students the opportunity to play middle school sports. All right. We have a proposal that was put before us that the uh, sixth grade students in the Monroe School District can be included in uh, the seventh and eighth grade um, sports, with the exception of football, I believe, is that one. And this is an action item as well. 
Um, so this is a uh, four action that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves sixth grade students to participate in middle school sports. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve sixth grade students to participate in middle school sports. Is there a second? Second. All right, there is a motion and a second uh, discussion. Uh, we also have Director Human Resources, Cassandra Bernie can talk us through, oh, sorry, that's the following items for that. Um, wanted to talk, are there any questions that you guys have about uh, adding the sixth graders to that? I guess just in general, um, what are other middle schools doing? Why was this rule put into place in the first place? A um, little background would be helpful. Yeah, I know that Sean would, would be able to answer some of that. I had a meeting with him this last week, and I know that uh, it is pretty common for a lot of other schools. Part of the concern was, one, the ability to participate. So I know a lot of sixth graders have a lot of club teams that they've participated in, and then there are some other schools that are doing that to include. Some of them are having a hard time filling their rosters with, um, with those, but then also it allows – it's an equity piece as well for students who uh, can't afford to play on club teams or select teams – as well, it, it lowers the, the threshold for kids to start playing school teams uh, where they're not having to pay and travel and things like that uh, as early. And I think that there's uh, a finance and a security reason for uh, this, the football one, but the other ones is not as much of an issue. Um, the why on this says, and I'm just going to read through this really quickly. Uh, the why says it provides an increased opportunities for all students to engage in extracurricular activities at the middle school level. The historical prevention of sixth grade students for middle school sports has been a barrier to a natural connection point to school for many of our students. Sixth grade students in general enter middle school with a high sense of enthusiasm in part due to the extracurricular activities that are often connected to school, which are not part of the elementary uh, elementary. Uh, school experience, waiting for waiting an entire school year to engage in school sports dampens enthusiasm for school and pre, uh, presents a missed opportunity for capitalizing what is occurring in the natural development process uh, for our students. Engaging students in our middle school sports program starting at sixth grade can build a sense of community and connection over the course of the next three years students spend at the middle school level. Critical social and coping skills are developed through participation in extracurricular activities and in ath athletics in, in particular. Not providing these opportunities represents a gap in skill development for our sixth grade students. And historically, there have been sports offered at the middle school level that produce a low number of athletes uh, turning out. That was one of, the, one of the issues as well. Expanding our offering to sixth grade students would help increase our numbers overall and help us field uh, full teams at every sport. And so the question also was kind of the why now. WIA approved rules change uh, approved rules changes that govern the involvement of sixth graders in school sports. So in October, 2023, so this is a relatively recent change within the last year. The specific rule policy now states uh, sixth graders attending a middle school of any size may participate in any seventh and eighth grade program, except football. So there, again, there's that reason. And the follow, if the following conditions are met and so school principal, superintendent, local school board approval. So that's why it's brought before us for consideration. Uh, league approval and WIAA district approval. So we would be able to approve it for our school, but then the other schools in our league that those students would be participating against would have to do that. I know that there is a push for that in Snohomish County. Um, and so a lot of the schools that are within our league, I think will be moving in that direction as well. And so I think seeing that change last year allows us to say, let's go ahead and start the school district off as early as we can this year to do that. Um, so he, Sean and I had a, a conversation on Thursday last week about this. So he went over a lot of that and that's why he put that in the email that he sent out to us. So the steps for this are preview with the superintendent, uh, which he's already done. Uh, so there's a proposal uh, with for his feedback, establish a realistic time frame for approval by the school board. And so our approval of that will then allow us to, to uh, have them uh, flesh out a timeline of what that would look like. And then he can put that out to his athletic directors and coaches and they can reach out to other teams. Um, and then it, then it would go for our approval. And then, uh, and then it would be approval by the uh, North County and Snow King Athletic Leagues, which are what our teams plan. And what I also like about this for me, I think this was my biggest feedback, is it doesn't make sixth graders have to play. It just opens the opportunity for those who want to. So that was the majority of our conversation, and he put that in the email. Yeah, it just seems unusual. I don't – it's an idea that's just – I don't have any context 
or, or knowing how the sports work at that age and having younger kids participate in older kids' sports. Um, Sean was here just to give some more kind of the, the rationale or the reasoning for this. Um, I don't know how to respond. I mean, it sounds good. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's, you know, sixth graders going in. Maybe that's going to keep uh, the uh, opportunity for kids in higher grade. So you have an exceptional sixth grader and then that takes it away from a seventh or eighth grade. I just, just seems, I don't have any context for it. Well, he did talk about some of the details of that and that's what he would have to flesh out with the coaches. And he said that it, it doesn't mean that we would have to say, okay, like if you have a cutting team where you're cutting your sixth graders as much as it's saying, well, if you only have so many slots for let's say a basketball team, but one of the conversations that he and I had last Thursday was um, you can still say, Hey, it allows the sixth graders to practice with the seventh and eighth graders more. So you can possibly build out a JV team or a C squad, or it allows the students to say, okay, maybe the sixth graders don't get all the playing time, but they get all the practice time with the older kids. One of the big differences too, is you'll notice when you walk into middle school is you'll have sixth graders who are this tall and eighth graders who are taller than you. And there's a lot of growing that happens in that age range as well. But he said one of the big uh, things was it allows sixth graders also as they're growing very fast. And so there's a lot of coordination that happens at that age. And so allowing them to stay engaged in sports um, is really helpful as well. So I didn't see any drawbacks to it, especially because it doesn't force anybody. It just allows them to play. And especially since WIA has opened those rules up, it allows us to say yes to more kids. So any other Discussions? Okay, there's a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your hand. All right, motion passes four to zero. And that will allow our school to move on with the sixth graders participating in sports. Agenda item 5.02. All right. Um, it's consideration of adoption of policy th uh, 3206, pregnant and parenting students. This one is just for information. This is for... Um, uh, this is just the first reading. I know that um, there are some new laws that have been, have been passed, so Wazda has sent some of that out. So now, Cassandra, we can have you come up. Can you fill us in on a couple of these uh, uh, new laws and policies that are coming out for us? Yeah, so what we have before you today is a first reading on two new policies. So uh, these are uh, based on Wazda policies uh, 3206 and 5012. Um, both of these are in response to the new Title IX regulations and the increased focus on um, accommodating and, and um, making sure that we're not discriminating against uh, pregnant or parenting uh, students or staff. And then we also have a proposal to uh, revise our existing policy 5011, um, which is our sexual harassment for staff. Uh, and then you have the second reading on the 3205, which are, is our sexual harassment on students for students. Um, so all of these really are in response to the new Title IX regulations and to get us kind of shored up with the uh, WASDA recommendations. Do you guys have any questions for Cassandra while she's here with that? So yeah, real quick. Um, <clears throat> since these are new policies, are they? Are, is this not covered under current policies? The new ones that are more specific with pregnancy and pregnancy related conditions so they they go into a little bit more detail and and are specific to that aspect of um, potential sex-based harassment So agenda item 5.02 is a policy that is, it's in the 3000 series. That's why it's 3206. So this has to deal with uh, dealing with students and uh, who are parenting or students who are pregnant. And so it gives them extra provision under the new Title IX laws. So there's a lot of it, this whole section of the, of the business section, all of these policy items are really in response to the same thing, which is what Cassandra's kind of sharing that with us. We've already started one of that. That's why it's the second reading, but uh, 
policy 3206 is basically saying we uh, we will not allow any students to be harassed or um, made to, to have to have to we can we will provide accommodations for them as well if we have uh, students who are parents students who are pregnant and then 5.03 I believe is basically the same thing but for staff that's why it's a 5,000 series yeah correct? the five five zero one two one two yep. yes okay and then um, and then we have the sexual harassment ones which I think are basically mere policies as well one for staff one for students why is one is a 5,000 series and one is a 3,000 series because those are separate sections of our policies is that correct yes okay correct. Sandra, can you walk us through just real briefly what some of the big updates were with the Title IX changes that are kind of causing the, I don't want to say a cascade, but it does cause a wave of a lot of updates in uh, education to update their policies. So some of the biggest changes are, well, they came into alignment with Washington state law as far as some of the um, different covered groups or or designations for sex-based harassment. So things like gender identity and um and pieces that were not previously part of federal law, even though they were part of Washington state law. So that's part of the changes. Part of it is an increased focus on um, systemic culture and, and policies and things that are happening as a district or building as a whole versus individual situations. So uh, an increased focus on Title IX coordinator tracking those in occurrences and looking for patterns and seeing if there's uh, education that we need to be enacting. Part of it is uh, a increased training for staff. So uh, now all staff members have to be trained on Title IX. And then the other focus is that uh, pregnancy and, and pregnancy related conditions and making sure that we're supporting those staff or students uh, to make sure that they're still able to access their education and uh, not be not experience discrimination based on those conditions. One of the question I have for that is with the some of the updates with Title IX and the walking through of all of the, the, you know, the online training that you have all of the staff members go through, is there a cycle that you have to have them trained every so often, obviously as you onboard new staff members, that's a part of the onboarding process. But let's say there's a staff member who does that, is it like every three years or in every five years, or is it just one and done? What does that look like? Or does the state determine any of that? It's annually. So for, okay. for the majority of our staff members, it's an annual training. And then anybody who uh, has a, an additional role, like so for myself as coordinator, then I have some additional training requirements. Uh, and, and so would somebody if they were a decision maker, for example. Okay. Um, but for most of our staff, it is an annual training. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so that covers agenda item 5.01, which allows for, sorry, sorry thank you, 5.02, which allows for consideration of um, uh, protections for st uh, students uh, who are pregnant and parenting students. And then 5.03, is the same uh, policy, but for staff members. So um, par uh, parental family or marital status and pregnancy or related conditions for staff. And this is also first reading. So there's no motions or um, action items that we need to do. This is for informational. So go ahead and feel free to uh, read through that, you guys. And then we will put those on for our second reading in our next meeting. Is that correct, Holly? Yeah. Okay. And then 5.04, also informational consideration of updating revisions. Uh, that's an update because we already have actually a sexual harassment policy, but that brings us into compliance with Title IX. And that is uh, 5011, which is for staff. And then the 3000 series is the one that we have action item to go to next. All right. So that said, um, that brings us to agenda item 5.05. Thank you so much, Cassandra. I appreciate that. And you're working our human resources office. Um, so we are on our second reading. Agenda item 5.05, .05, consideration of revisions of policy 3205, sexual harassment of students prohibited. Uh, is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve the revisions to policy 3205, sexual harassment of students prohibited. And is there a second? Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? 
this is our second reading, so this is one that will require action today. There's no discussion. One thing I just want to point out, all of these all of these action items are required by the state of Washington because when they change up the update their laws, it requires our district to come into compliance for that. So there is a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. And abstain. Okay. Motion passes three, two, win, one abstain. All right. Moving on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve agenda item 6.08? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the consent agenda dated October 28th, 2024. All right, there's a motion. Uh, is there a second? Second. All right. So a motion is second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the consent agenda dated October 28, 2024. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes 420. All right, we will not have a superintendent update as Superintendent Woodward is out for this evening. Uh, board comments, so we'll move on to agenda item 8.01, board uh, reports and comments. Does anyone wanna go first? Okay, well, this is kind of a long one, so hang in there with me. Uh, we have a lot of congratulations uh, in order to start off. So with our sports, we have Jacob Schaefer and Miles Baumchin, who are our Westco North doubles champs. They earned the number one seed in District 1 Boys Tennis Tournament, which is going to be happening this week. Also, congratulations to Miguel Maligan and Murphy Thompson for placing fifth in doubles and securing an alternate spot for the District 1 tournament. In football, congratulations for becoming the West Coast champs. That's really exciting and it was really fun. I know it was really exciting to be at that homecoming game too. Uh, cross country, congratulations to the boys varsity. They placed fourth in West Coast North led by Owen Egan, Heffernan with a third place finish and Seth Wood who had a fourth place finish. The boys team moves on to the district finals along with two of our girls varsity, cross country runners, charity persons and Kaithara Bushnell. Uh, and I apologize if I'm getting anybody's names wrong. I'm really trying. <laughs> the other huge shout out congratulations. We have a senior at Sky Valley named Morgan Dunlap who uh, on October 30th of this, this year, yeah, Morgan and the rest of Teens Helping Teens, it's a 4-H group, they will be receiving an award from the Washington State Healthcare Authority, the 2024 Prevention Award of Excellence Youth Leadership. So over the past three and a half years, her group has been working in collaboration with the Washington State Healthcare Authority and Washington State University to build a teen leadership task force focusing on suicide prevention. They received additional national funding for 4-H in May, and we'll find out about further funding in the coming months to make this nationally available to teens around the U.S., and US territories. They've been speaking at public events and conferences along with private events, spreading their message and making an impact. They also uh, might be going to Washington DC. So she was one of 90 students to be chosen to go to Washington DC um, and speak, I believe. So just a huge congratulations to Morgan Dunlap and the students that she's been working with. This is incredible. What an amazing thing to do for your fellow peers and to really make a lasting impact that uh, expands far beyond your own community. So that's incredible. And then also just wanted to give a shout out to girls soccer. They had their senior night. We have so many seniors on the girls soccer team and there were multiple sets of twins, which is just kind of crazy. So we, it felt like forever we were sitting there acknowledging all these incredible young women um, and just honoring their time that they have spent as student athletes in the girls soccer program. I also had the opportunity to visit Monroe High School and Frank Wagner over the last couple of weeks. And I'm always just so amazed every time I go in there at staff, students, the, the way the schools are, just how much is given in these buildings for the betterment of our students. It's 
it's always a bucket filler and I'm always happy to be there. So looking forward to getting into another school this week, every Thursday, I'm making the rounds, man. Um, I wouldn't miss it. So also I want to give a shout out on Saturday. We had a group come together to just sit down and talk with a lot of our um, sports teams, our local sports teams that service our youth, because we want to know how we can improve, right. And what we can do better. And so for Sean and Dawn, Joan, Adam, and Stacy for being able to put that on, for being there to help facilitate that and really just giving a voice to all of these volunteers who tirelessly serve our community and our students to help make things better for them. Uh, so it was really great. I'm super thankful for everybody that came to participate and to give us that feedback because we can't get better if we don't know how to improve. So I feel really hopeful about it. It was really awesome, especially since my three boys participate in a lot of those things. And I wanna keep those sports programs around for a very long time for the youth in this community. Um, yeah, so that is what I have for you this week. I tried to keep it shorter, but yeah, I hope everybody has a safe Halloween if that's something that you go out and do. And um, yeah, don't eat too much, don't eat too much candy. <laughs> Did you have anything? Awesome. I think one thing that I wanted to add, you guys have already talked about a lot of it, so I didn't want to take up more time, but just one small thing I wanted to add is one, I was really excited to see um, uh, some of the work coming out of uh, like our facility use um, meeting that we had recently, and then also hearing really good things already. Um, it's just small things here, but about the, the uh, non-contact or not non-contact, the non-student day on Friday, which was not a day for homecoming tailgating, but a day for staff <laughs> development. Uh, but um, uh, my son thought it was for <laughs> just an extra day off for a homecoming game. Um, but really a lot of the, uh, the staff development coming out of that. And so um, I know you ladies did a lot of work for getting that going and I'm already hearing a lot of great things about that. So I'm excited to hear about what's coming out of uh, some of the staff development days and as they get an extra day to kind of really just uh, dive in and focus on instruction and assessment and collaboration, things like that. So um, I love when we have conversations about student data, student learning, like that's when we're actually getting a lot of the work done and moving the needle. Even the um, workshop earlier this evening or this afternoon, um, seeing a lot of the similarities across like every, all five of our elementary schools are looking at going back to, you know, the science of reading and uh, phonics again, and getting back to a lot of very, um, powerful reading strategies, helping students and looking at their attendance numbers and their, uh, their uh, goals for math and ELA and their stretch goals for their students and seeing many of them saying, well, we didn't hit all of our goals on all of these things, but moving the needle by very large margins um, from previous years and the goals that they have uh, and the strategies that they have in order to say, okay, this is how we've either made or, or met or not met our goal. And here's what we know we've been able to identify and how we can move that needle. And so for me, that gives me a lot of excitement between last uh, meeting that we had and this meeting of uh, getting back and talking about uh, strategies for instruction, strategies for belonging, strategies for attendance, which all of those things are correlated even with Brooke's uh, um, uh, presentation, the, the correlation between attendance and um, uh, just mental health for students is, is huge. I mean, students who are connected and who feel like they belong are going to be students who are going to be a lot more successful. And they, uh, the things that we've looked at with grades and um, success rates and student data with attendance, I mean, when you're here and you're engaged, things happen. I mean, it's not rocket science, but how do we get students? It's not necessarily complicated, but it's not easy either. And so how do we get students to get engaged that way? So I'm excited about those strategies. So as we continue to move forward, those are things I'm looking forward to continue to see that are going well. All right. That said, it is 5.58 with no other comments. The meeting is adjourned.